Uh, my name is Tim Simmons. I'm a restoration ecologist with the Massachusetts Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program with the, the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife. We're at Pilot Island Creek in Newberry, Massachusetts, and the background is the Great Marsh, the largest salt marsh in New England. More people than not that I'm acquainted with have never been out on the marsh. They have no idea that we have this wilderness system in our backyard with all these riches that we've described. And I'd like to change that to uh, the extent possible. Um, but whether or not they ever get out on the marsh, they need to understand that that marsh is preventing the inland areas from catastrophic flooding. And uh, it serves uh, as a, a buffer in its natural state to storms that would be just devastating to this area if the marsh was not there or if the marsh fails in any way. It's uh, incalculable, the values that it's bringing to our lives, whether you ever see it or not. The salt marsh system is one of the, the richest systems, ecosystems, that we have. Uh, it supports microscopic plants and animals that in turn serve the, uh, serve the needs of the, the larger ones. And it's a very dynamic system. We get a different tide almost every different day, distributing these nutrients and these organisms to these different places. And some comes in on the tide and some goes out on the tide. And a lot of stuff gets just left behind on a slowly falling tide. So things are constantly moving, uh, both in the water column and in the surface. And this system is growing. It's our newest form of land because of those dynamics. This is actually growing out from the land base and extending itself because without Phragmites, it too can alter its own system to benefit the native plants and animals. And that's what we're after. I tend to think of Phragmites as both a, a disease and a symptom of disease. It alters the system it invades. It is uh, remarkably good at, through transpiration, while photosynthesizing, uh, moving water up through the stems and into the air column. So we've seen uh, water go down when the sun comes up and come back up when the sun goes down. But over time, it actually changes the hydrology enough to benefit itself over the other plants. And there's also some evidence that it secretes a toxic chemical to other plants that also keeps them from growing. So it's got more strategies than we do. And we need to take advantage of the biology of that plant to the extent possible to reverse those trends and alterations it makes to the environment itself. What does the marsh do? What does it support? All the bird life that's out there, it's a very rich system that gets impoverished when Phragmites moves in because the animals that were accustomed to uh, and evolved with a healthy marsh are suddenly faced with something that is completely foreign to their evolutionary biology. And uh, some animals do adapt to it and some animals do use it. And it often takes over our cattail marshes, our native cattail marshes, which are important to a whole plethora of different nesting birds. And those birds these will not uh, nest in the Phragmites. It has the capacity to grow in standing water, not just uh, on the salt marsh and the saturated areas. It'll grow out into the standing water and it will change the cover and therefore the, the base of the food chain will actually change and the various uh, fin fish that are are important to the larger fish that we depend on are, are deprived of the conditions they need to thrive. And so it will change uh, even the circulation patterns. And so the fish that are accustomed to feeding in a certain uh, circulation time uh, are deprived of that too. It probably came in as ballast in the, in the early 1600s and 1700s. It was used to uh, pad cargo uh, and it's uh, from various places in uh, Europe, Africa, Asia. And it spread from all the ports 
in all directions. It spreads by seed, it spreads by rhizome, it spreads by broken stems, and it spreads by wind because it has millions of fertile seeds that are very light. Our early records here, I'm not sure, uh, before the 1950s tropical storms, but uh, after those, we very much started to see a, a big increase. Well, we certainly boosted its capacity by uh, altering, especially physically. It does follow the footprint of physical disturbances. And then once it's established, it's an opportunist and it'll go just about anywhere. But the ditches we put in the marsh didn't help. Uh, some of the uh, road construction we've done didn't help. Not only did they provide a disturbance, but they provided a corridor for those wind-blown seeds to just be dispersed right down those roads. And we see that uh, in the interior U.S. and interior Massachusetts, too. Uh, the seed viability is a curious feature. Uh, early on, we were testing the, the uh, viability of seeds from various stands in Massachusetts, and they were coming back as 95% infertile. Now we see seeds that are almost 100% fertile. And what's happening is this is a wind-pollinated plant, and we've had this stock that's been delivered from all these various different places, and the wind is blowing them together and making this super Phragmites that has more viable, but it's also uh, hardier in a lot of these uh, harsher conditions. So the longer a, a stand has been there, the tougher it's going to be and the more genetically diverse it's going to be and the more uh, the more viability that seeds will have. Other coalitions uh, in the country that are catching on that it's going to take a team effort to do this, but they're also finding that they have a, a pretty tough plant that responds well to disturbances. That's what it likes to begin with. So if you cut it, it's going to say thank you uh, if you don't spray. And the best treatments that we've come up with uh, are the use of uh, herbicides, uh, glyphosate in particular, but others as well. They're amino acid inhibitors, and they, they work quite well if you apply at the right time of year and at the uh, appropriate uh, dilution. And we've had great success in other places, um, but I don't know of anywhere that has this much diffuse uh, patches in all these different spots, so it's hard to get to here. And it's very difficult to do it all by hand tools or even uh, aquatic-based uh, equipment. Uh, the chemical that we use inhibits the plant's ability to uh, photosynthesize and metabolize and do with ordinary plant functions. So it interferes with the capacity of the plant to, uh, to provide for itself. And it does it very rapidly. And we use a time of year now in the fall when the, the plant is delivering all its uh, nutrients from above ground to below ground. So we use the plant as the delivery system to get to the below ground rhizomes, which are the real target. There's a much more uh, mass to those than there are to the above ground. Well, the Marsh Master here is about the only piece of equipment that can get us into those places. Uh, it's very uh, difficult for people on foot. The marshes can be very un unforgiving to the pedestrian. <laughs> oh. So we use that and it enables us to more efficiently move from patch to patch and then treat the patch once you're there. Uh, again, we, we treat in the fall and we watch very carefully to see what kind of response we get. Uh, usually it's 85 to 90 percent kill, uh, but there's a few spindly uh, shoots that are coming up from the living rhizome that did not get treated. So we have to go back and, and just hand treat those uh, just so they don't get reestablished. But you can have a, a remarkable recovery uh, in, a, in a single season. So we've looked, and other people have looked, uh, everywhere we've been doing this, because it was controversial in the beginning, what were we going to be doing to the marsh? Were we going to alter it permanently while we were trying to restore it? Uh, but we've seen absolutely no non-target impacts. And if there are, uh, they're minor, an overspray of a, of a native plant nearby, they all come back. So what we really see, the most dramatic effects we see are the return of the native from the seed bank that's been suppressed for many, many years now. Girardia plants, very showy, shows up in the fall, 
has responded remarkably well to these treatments. Uh, we track it barely in Massachusetts, but it's actually protected in Maine and, and New Hampshire because they have less salt marsh and they have less healthy salt marsh. So it's nice to see those things come back very readily. It's important that you've uh, brought this coalition together because it's going to take resources from everybody and commitment from everyone. All those organizations, all those agencies need to understand that there's a serious problem. There's an infection of this marsh that is not going to go away without active management. So we need to take appropriate active management and treat it now. There is some compelling evidence that uh, some of the alterations that have occurred over the past four decades on the marsh are beginning to impinge on its capacity to, uh, to rebound from disturbance. And the system that's disturbed every day uh, has a lot of resilience built into it, but we really don't know what's going to happen to this marsh as climate change is occurring and how it can keep up with uh, changes that we're, we're beginning to believe are more rapid than anything it's ever seen before. So it's important to address that issue simultaneously and protecting areas where this marsh wants to grow into. Many of those are built, but we've actually targeted areas that aren't built where we think the marsh is going to migrate as sea level changes. And that's going to be important to allow its resilience to uh, display itself. Again, uh, this is Tim Simmons with the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program, and I want to thank you for taking the time to uh, educate yourselves via this medium, and uh, please do support this work in your communities.